you, Alicia, for the kind introduction, and thank you, ASF, for inviting me um, today to present. Um, where's the clicker? Here it is. Okay. Um, and I'm actually particularly grateful that I got asked to speak on this topic um, because this is one that's actually very professionally and personally important to me. Um, what I'm going to do is start by reviewing some kind of helpful lessons that I've learned over the years of conducting clinical research and trials with families. But then I'm going to actually pivot to what I think is like really the crux of this issue, which is that, you know, we need to figure out and find ways to prepare with families by developing collaborations and partnerships. And I'm going to basically spend most of this talk telling you about one story that hopefully really embodies kind of the power of these partnerships. Okay, so let's start with kind of some of the basics of preparation. So I organize my approach when I think about preparing um, families for trials into three main categories. Um, you know, nothing though I will say is more important than informed consent. Um, so when you're, um, if you're a family who is in entering a trial and thinking about um, joining a trial, you know, ask all the questions that you need to ask as you're reading through that consent form, which can be sometimes 30 and 40 pages, right? It's a lot of lingo and jargon, and I think it's important on our end to make sure that we are describing and explaining all the steps of the trial in incredible detail. So always ask questions. I think it's really critical. Why do we need to prepare well? Well, it, it minimizes attrition, it improves engagement of families, um, and it really does, again, allow for those partnerships that I'll talk about. So starting with kind of the practical aspect of preparation, um, this I think is really key to help families really know what to expect in a trial. And so with regards to preparing caregivers, we spend a lot of time talking to families about what's involved just from a very practical standpoint in terms of the visits. How long does it take? How much travel is involved? You know, what, are you, what is going to be the experience for you and your child? That allows a lot of preparation on the family's end in terms of getting childcare, financial resources, whatever is needed to make sure that the trial can really happen. Um, we also want to make sure we're preparing kids from a practical standpoint also, right? It's not easy to be in a study. And so we spend a lot of time with developing videos and um, even sort of um, uh, picture boards and things like that that help kids know what to maybe expect. We prepare desensitization tools. So for instance, we do a lot of work with EEG and we create, um, so the company we work with actually has um, training nets, which are little tight caps that we can send home with the family so that the child, if it's helpful, can get used to what that feels like before actually the study starts. This is a picture of one of our kiddos wearing one of those, um, one of those nets, um, which she wore everywhere, including to school, and she really enjoyed it. Um, from a conceptual preparation standpoint, I think this is really important, and this is where actually buy-in really happens. There's quite a bit of stigma around trials, right? And there's a lot of unknowns, and you heard a lot talked about today already about the placebo effect and the different types of trials. And I think it's very important for us as, as researchers and clinicians to talk openly with families about these basic concepts. What is the trial design? Is it a phase two? Well, then we're really trying to establish safety more than anything else. A phase three trial is really trying to establish efficacy, meaning is the drug potentially effective for improving symptoms. Um, phase three trials often have a placebo arm. And I will say that the placebo is one of the areas that is probably of most concern for families. Um, patients don't want to be in a placebo arm. They don't want to receive the non-drug. And this is a discussion we have to have openly because it makes sense that one would not want the, um, the non-drug if there's a hope that that drug could be helpful. And the way we talk to families about that is really that without that placebo control group or some other comparison group, we won't get to the point where we can show effectiveness to then make that drug available to communities more broadly. But again, this is a discussion we have to have up front because it's a very, very, um, uh, it's a real concern and it's, it's valid. Um, the other big area of concern for parents is around benefit and risk, right? So what if my child has an adverse reaction? What do I do? Can I drop out of the trial if I'm worried about the effect on my child? And of course, at any time a family can withdraw from a trial, but I found that sometimes families don't know that going in. They're scared about that, right? So what if something bad happens and I can't tell anyone about it? You know, how do I, how do I advocate for my child's safety and well-being? And I think, again, that's something that we have to really talk about. And then lastly is really emotional preparation, which I think sometimes is the most challenging because the range of feelings around treatment is wide, right? And sometimes unexpected. Um, you know, I would say that it's something that parents often don't want to talk about, but there are, from my experience, two really overwhelming emotions that drive the experience of being a trial. One is hope, 
right, which is the hope that something's going to work, something that is, is really going to help um, their child. And that is such a, we'll talk about it when I tell the story, but that's something that's incredibly palpable and powerful, but it also can be detrimental. If the hope is so great that the drug is going to work, then the possibility of being on placebo, for instance, is much less um, attractive, right? The other really big emotion is fear, right? Fear that it won't work fear that there will be an adverse event that really is detrimental. And I think, again, it's not to say that we can address those emotions because we all feel them as we go through this process. It's that we have that dialogue, that we respect those feelings, and we recognize that those feelings change over time, and that we, as partners with families, need to be able to have an open dialogue and, again, really embrace the fact that these feelings are going to develop and evolve um, over the course of a trial. Okay, and so with that, I'm gonna pivot here and talk again about really partnering with families. So how do we take the principles of kind of preparation and think about partnership? And to start, I wanna actually, rem to start this, this discussion, I wanna remind you, as Jeremy already talked about a bit, that the autism field has benefited tremendously from discoveries in genetics, many of which have been really accelerated by the Simons Foundation and others, where we've identified thousands of genetic causes of autism. And um, while individually rare, together these are very powerful um, um, and, and um, important sort of subgroups within the autism spectrum. And what's happened is that it, as each genetic condition is identified, right, parents get together. They meet on social media, they find each other, and they create these very powerful patient advocacy groups or PAGs. And one of the main goals of these PAGs is to accelerate research. It's to advocate and support families, of course but it's to accelerate research and really fundamentally recently is to accelerate clinical trial development. I will mention also that the Autism Science Foundation has actually been really instrumental in helping these different PAGs um, collaborate with each other because there's a lot of common you know, needs that they have and common questions and common programs that they're developing. An agenda which was developed by the ASF led by Alicia Halliday has provided a platform for these PAGs to actually talk to each other. And that's been a, a very important um, contribution to the field. Okay, so I'm going to talk about one specific syndrome in the rest of my time, and I'm gonna tell one story. Hopefully it really um, uh, shows you sort of the experience of partnering directly with families, and again, how important this collaboration is. So Duke 15Q syndrome is one genetic cause of neurodevelopmental disorders. It's caused by duplications on chromosome 15. Um, these children have many of the features that we see in other genetic causes of neurodevelopmental disorders. They have global delay, hypotonia, autism, as well as epilepsy. It turns out they also happen to have an electrophysiological or EEG pattern that suggests that there's alterations in GABA, which is a inhibitory neurotransmitter, alterations in GABA signaling. It basically looks like there's too much GABA neurotransmission happening in the brain. And that's important because there's several GABA receptor genes that are in that 15Q region that are overexpressed or duplicated. So that EEG pattern might be a biomarker, but it also actually gives us the clue for a drug target. And as we started seeing these children in clinic and started thinking about research programs really to actually quantify the biomarker, um, Roche Pharmaceuticals actually had a compound, which is a GABA-negative allosteric modulator, or kind of a GABA antagonist, that was being used in other indications, but had the potential to, once they were done studying those other indications, to maybe be repurposed for this rare condition where this might be a true precision-targeted therapy. And so we decided to really be proactive in getting ready for a potential trial. And I want to sort of highlight the fact that this was done in a very proactive way in the backdrop of an experience that we had had with this patient advocacy group um, you know, around the same time, which was that another pharmaceutical company, um, Ovid, and in partnership with Takeda, had a drug which was an anti-epileptic that really dampens excitatory or glutaminergic activity called TAC-935, not very, not very, um, um, very technical um, name. Um, but, uh, and the goal of this trial was to see if it could improve epilepsy in, um, uh, in children with different developmental uh, epileptic encephalopathies. Um, but this trial, as a subset of the larger epilepsy trial, this company also set out to test the effectiveness of this drug in DUP15Q and CDKL5, two, ge again, genetic forms of epilepsy and neurodevelopmental disorders. And we had a bear of a time getting um, 
uh, recruitment and enrollment on the Duke 15Q community. There was a lot of concern around, you know, the trial design, the safety and efficacy, the safety of the drug. Um, parents told us that they felt like there was very little communication between the, you know, the sponsor and the families. And so what ended up happening was the, the out, this phase two trial was published, but if you look at the paper, you'll see that most of the effectiveness was in CDKL5 because we had a much larger sample, representative sample in that population. And so if this drug goes to FDA approval, it will only move forward in CDKL5, not in Duke15Q. And it was all because of our issues around engaging with families. And so we wanted to change the narrative here. And so what we did was we, again, became very proactive and we engaged families at three different stages, um, which I'm gonna talk quickly about here. So the first was really an outreach and engagement. And what we did, and this is before the trial was even designed or launched, is we started having dialogues with families. We had Facebook live sessions, we had webinars. The Duke 15Q Alliance website pulled a lot of great information from clinicaltrials.gov to address some of these questions around what are different trial designs? What is a placebo? Why do we need one, right? What are adverse events? How do you communicate with a provider if you're concerned about adverse events? Um, we, made, we took a lot of um, time to really develop these materials. With regards to actually then getting ready for the trial, the trial readiness that we've talked about here, you know, we set out to really quantify that EEG biomarker and to think about, as you've heard about earlier, what might be clinical endpoints that are most helpful in Duke15Q syndrome. And the way we did this work is we went to the community. So we actually attended the Duke15Q Alliance sponsored patient um, patient meetings, so a family meetings. So they have family meetings every other year where families converge from all over the world to meet with each other, talk to each other, and they learn about you know, any research or science that's being done at the time. And we actually collected data at the meetings with families engaged. It was incredible. We collected EEG data and motor gait data, all the behavioral testing. It was all done at those family meetings. And based on that experience, we actually were able to do what we set out to do. We quantified the biomarker, and all this is published. Um, we actually determined which clinical endpoints might be most effective, just based on, again, having studied over 100 kids with Duke15Q in their communities. And I'll also mention that we partnered with a um, company to interview families around really the important question of, what are the areas of need that you have? Where do you think, where would you like to see the most gain being made for your child? Um, and that interview actually leads to the development of something called a disease concept model, which is something actually that the FDA really wants. It's very helpful when we're trying to get drugs approved or even trials approved by the FDA to have a concept model already created. It allows us to say, look, we've engaged with families and this is what we think is important. So all that was done in partnership with families. And then finally, we actually, the drug was available and the trial was actually launched last fall. And this was really exciting. This trial was called Clindesum. It was a phase two, so primary safety, secondary efficacy trial for children ages two to 11 with Duke15Q syndrome. And in fact, the biomarker that we quantified um, was meant to be the marker of drug target engagement to tell us whether the drug was actually working. And all those clinical endpoints I described were really the endpoints that we were using to measure success of the drug. With Roche, we created patient-facing materials like this, and you don't have to read all these details, but really just to say, like, look, what is the trial? What is this drug? How does it work in the body, right? We made lots of materials like this, and I give Roche a lot of credit for partnering with us on creating these, um, these tools that allowed us to actually have meaningful dialogues with families about this um, study. And this summer, last summer, it, this all culminated at the family meeting in Nashville. And I will tell you, these family meetings started out 10 years ago as a small group of families who really weren't that interested in research. To now, this meeting was almost 1,000 people, over 500 families, many of whom had children with new diagnoses. And that meeting was just full of hope. And the keynote speaker, who's depicted here, Mike Porath, who actually has created, he's the, um, he started a, um, a web-based um, health platform called The Mighty. He also has a daughter with Duke15Q syndrome. And he talked about his experience with his daughter, Annabelle, but in his keynote talk, he put up this number 90. Okay, so 90 was the number of kids that needed to be enrolled in this trial for us to be able to hopefully move to phase three. And the whole meeting, people just talked about 90 and how they wanted to be engaged and help out. Every single breakout room had a QR code that parents could um, access so that they could sign up just to learn more about the trial. 
And so this was, the whole meeting was rallied around this. And I will tell you, it was breathtaking, the power of the community last summer in Nashville. This is just a picture of my, my team, my small team, um, during the um, patient parade with all of our pom-poms. Um, and it was, you know, the message was, again, and the feeling was one of hope. And I just will just, you know, I had an outpouring of emails and texts and things sent from parents. But I loved this one because it just, again, really emphasized the hope. So a mom said, you know, as one mom so eloquently put it, we're all part of a club none of us wanted to join. But you chose this club. You could have focused on anything, but you chose us. It gives parents like me so much hope for what lies ahead. And within a month of launching this trial in the U.S., we had four children enrolled, 40 were screened, 25 were on the wait list. Those are the sites. We had four active sites, four that were waiting to start. Um, and four enrolled was actually what we were aiming for. This was a very involved trial, and so it actually did need kind of slow enrollment. For me personally at CHLA, it was incredibly gratifying because the first child in the trial, Logan, um, was one of my first patients with Do15Q, who I diagnosed at 18 months. He has profound autism, he has intellectual disability, he's fairly well-controlled epilepsy, he loves to give kisses and hugs, and he's an incredible kid, and he was my first patient in the trial at age 10. And then, three months into the trial, um, the somewhat unthinkable happened, um, but in retrospect, perhaps not entirely unexpected, just given the landscape of rare disease trials um, right now, um, which was that Roche announced um, that they had to close the trial. And this was just a couple of months in, um, and it was based on sort of strategic, um, you know, reallocations and things like that. Um, and I will just say that, you know, at this point, two paths could have been taken, and I think that the test of a strong partnership comes from adversity, um, and I think that path one uh, could have been anger and despair and despondency and defeat, um, or path two could have been one of courage, strength, resilience, and community and advocacy, and it was kind of automatic that path two was what we took, and this is what the parents did, and I'm just gonna spend the last couple minutes describing this for you, um, and I bring this up really not to make this about industry and Roche and the trial itself, but about what the partnership with families really meant and what these families did. So shortly after this announcement, I held a webinar with the Alliance and with families just to sort of come together and talk about what had happened and to think about how we can move forward. Within a week, more than 50 families sent letters to Roche. And, um, the, I wish I could read them all to you. They, I, I, you know, have tears to this day when I read them, but I wanted to highlight a couple that really emphasize and articulate the power of the community. So one family said, the population is small but mighty. In the last year, since my son's diagnosis, we've raised $25,000 for the Do 15Q Alliance, one single family, one community wrapped around a struggling 17-month-old affected. The need is here, the funding is here, the participation is here this community is where the advances are to be made. And another family, another parent said, you know, children are by their nature dependent, they're wholly reliant on others to care for them, nurture them, and help them. They deserve the absolute best that we as parents, family members, caregivers, teachers, friends, and a society can give them. So I cannot help but be utterly disappointed that as part of our society, you know, that, that our, our, we've failed our children. So, and they were writing these letters, not again to be victims, but to, to try to have a voice as a community to really help get this trial moving ahead. The other thing parents did, and I'm gonna end by showing you these and then we'll, I'll, I'll wrap up, um, is that families, and again, this was not promoted by me at all or, or, or prompted by me, um, they created a social media campaign, which were brief videos of their kids that they wanted, again, to share with the community. And I'm going to show you two right now. And again, I want to emphasize, this is really just to, you know, show how far the community came from, you know, eight years ago when they didn't even want to really engage in a trial. So this is Coral. I actually also um, have known her since she was about one.
second one is from Logan's family. God, I'm still counting my blessings. All that you've done in my life. The more that I look in the details, the more of your goodness I find. Father, on this side of heaven, I know that forever so god i will remember all of the reasons my heart has um i am actually um I, i'm not going to say more um about this but this is what this community has done and i think this is not just specific to d15q um this is the power of families, right? And so many of you are here today with that, but I think your voice is important. Um, and I will say that the story is not over, it's still unfolding. Um, I wish I could tell you that the end of the story was that the trial has started again. Um, it has not, but because of this and also the advocacy on our end as investigators and clinicians, um, there's been a lot of dialogues with you know, advocacy groups, with UC, with other biotechs, other, we're trying to figure out creative ways to bring this back. But what I also emphasize is that all the work we did leading up to that trial from the standpoint of, again, developing the biomarker, figuring out endpoints, like that will be helpful, right, in other ways. Um, and I think that, uh, again, the story still continues. And so with that, I'm just gonna end and say that, you know, we have entered a really unprecedented time in autism research where treatments are becoming a reality. There's a big promise there, as you've heard about from others. And really, I think core to clinical trial readiness is this partnership with families. Um, I love these families, I love these kids, um, and, I, uh, and I think that, again, there's no way forward without these, th these relationships. And we have to, you know, on, on our end, as clinicians and researchers, empower families with knowledge and also manage expectations and hope. Um, and I'll, ultimately, I will end just by saying we're all advocates, and I think that together we can find a path forward. So I will stop there and say thank you. Sorry I went over, but I'll. Thank you.